Hello, all of you out there in physics land. I'm Ben Canny, and this set of lectures or series of lectures is going to be on waves. So we're going to be talking about light and sound and uh, a little bit about seismic waves and really just anything that can be described as a wave or a vibration. Um, but before we do that, we need to figure out how do we tell different waves apart? And so we're going to start with um, how do we measure waves? Now, uh, this uh, segment of the lecture, uh, you'll need to take some notes, um, preferably bullet points is fine, at least three bullet points, but probably more than that. Uh, you'll also need to do a one to two sentence summary uh, of this segment. Um, this is likely going to be embedded in some sort of platform like Edpuzzle, um, so also answer any questions that pop up along the way um, or are attached to this afterwards. All right, so we're going to start off by talking about measuring um, vibrations and waves um, because really what we need to know is like if you go to the beach and you see two ocean waves, how do you know if they're identical in like size or um, like how fast they're moving or other things? Um, and so we need to be able to describe uh, waves and measure waves. So to do that, um, there are often two ways we can describe or measure things that are happening on a recurring basis. Um, we can talk about the amount of time between repetitions, or we can talk about the number of repetitions that are happening in a certain amount of time. Here's what I mean by that. Imagine, for example, we have a hummingbird like over here. Um, hummingbird flaps its wings 50 times each second. Now, we could talk about the time between each of those little flaps, um, where that would be 0 0.02 seconds. Uh, or we could talk about how many times that hummingbird is actually flapping its wings each second. Those are both going to be measuring kind of the speed or um, how often the hummingbird is flapping its wings. Um, but they're uh, two different ways of framing it. And each one is valuable in different times or different scenarios. Uh, we tend to use things like uh, this, which is period, uh, for things that are significantly longer and for things that are shorter repetitions, we tend to do a frequency measurement, which is what this is, which gets me to the following. So the amount of time between any repetitions uh, is called period uh, in physics, and the uh, number of repetitions occurring each second or minute or hour is called frequency. Um, we can use this terminology to describe waves um, along with anything else that repeats. So it doesn't just have to be an ocean wave. Uh, it could be um, anything else that's repeating, even like your hand waving back and forth, a uh, hummingbird flapping its wings, a uh, pendulum going back and forth, um, anything that basically has a cyclical nature to it or a repeating nature to it, you can use period and frequency to describe them. Now, uh, when we get to these types of slides, um, we're going to lay out all the important information about a uh, vocab term. Um, namely, it's usually going to be one uh, with a variable. So here um, you uh, can see the variable for period is a capital T. Um, and then the units for it uh, are measured in seconds. Now, you can actually use any other unit of time, um, but we will often use seconds. Uh, it's going to be important that you memorize these because as we get into problem solving, uh, if you don't know what the variables are or what like capital T stands for, um, then it'll be really difficult for you to uh, be solving any of the calculation problems that we do. Um, so to calculate period, uh, which is again the variable capital T, uh, you just simply take time divided by the number of repetitions. Uh, we'll often represent that as a small t over just like a little pound sign or hashtag um, for uh, the number count. Um, and this is an unofficial equation, so you're not going to see this on your equation sheets. Uh, we'll get to the one that you will see on your equation sheet in a little bit. Um, but before we move on, officially the definition of period is the time to complete one cycle. Alright, moving on to frequency. Um, frequency is the number of cycles per unit time. Uh, the variable for frequency is this little italicized F. Um, the units for frequency are Hertz, that's H-E-R-T-Z, spelled kind of like the car rental company, I believe, um, which is actually just an inverse second or second uh, to the negative first power. Or you can think of that as just simply one over a second. Um, so kind of like if we had one here and then seconds down here, that's what a hertz is. Um, frequency is the number of repetitions per unit time. So we just take the number of times something happened um, and divide it by the time it took for them to happen. So that's period and frequency. Now you may have noticed there's a lot of similarities in those two things. And yes, there is. 
So frequency is actually one over the period and period is one over the frequency. Um, so we can see that they're just inverses or reciprocals of each other. Now these are the only two equations you're gonna see on your equation sheet um, when we hand one out, etc. cetera. Um, so please make sure that you are, if you need to, memorizing the unofficial equations so that you're able to do the calculations. For some people it's intuitive, but um, sometimes it requires you to just memorize kind of how to calculate it until you get used to it. All right, so we've talked a little bit about um, period and frequency as ways to uh, measure vibrations or waves. Um, now let's talk a little bit about what's the difference between a vibration and a wave, because uh, while they're very much related, they're not the same thing. So vibrations are repetitive or periodic. That just means it happens over and over and over again. Um, motion back and forth, but it doesn't travel anywhere. So if you took a ruler like this picture over here and you plucked it so that it vibrated up and down, that would be a vibration because the ruler itself is not traveling anywhere. Those vibrations are staying all in one location. Um, a wave, on the other hand, would be a vibration that also travels someplace. Um, so you can think about the sound it makes actually travels from here to the ruler, uh, to the person's ears up here or things along those lines. So uh, to be clear, a vibration is something that is repetitive, um, a motion back and forth, but it doesn't travel anywhere, um, which gets us to a wave is periodic or repetitive motion or a disturbance that actually travels from like point A to point B. So you think about like this wave pulse inside of a rope or a uh, slinky um, where somebody snaps their wrist and makes this pulse, that wave actually travels down the string here or down the rope. So uh, we see a disturbance travel, um, but the material itself doesn't travel. So that's something that's important is uh, this section of rope doesn't go anywhere. It stays right here and just vibrates up and down, but the disturbance or the energy is actually what travels down the rope. All right, so sometimes we think about waves in like a stadium um, where it's the disturbance that moves, but not the people. So that's often an, an easy way to think about it. Um, so we're going to insert a video here um, to kind of show you that um, video comes from this uh, URL link right down here. Um, but you think about a wave inside of a stadium um, and the people don't move. Uh, so it's not like you get to ride your wave to a better seat in the stadium. You as a person um, vibrate, kind of move up and down, uh, but you don't get to travel anywhere. Another example of a uh, vibration uh, would be a guitar string. So the guitar string vibrates back and forth or up and down, um, but it doesn't travel anywhere. Uh, the wave example would be the sound that travels. All right, so just to cap it off, uh, the difference between vibrations and waves, um, or some similarities as well, um, vibrations and waves both uh, involve periodic motion or disturbances, that's a similarity. Um, a difference, though, is that uh, vibrations do not propagate. That's a big fancy word for traveling. Um, versus waves do travel. Just the disturbance, though, not the actual material of the wave that's traveling through itself. Um, so whatever the wave is traveling through just vibrates, but the wave or the energy travels. Um, vibrations can happen without creating a wave. Um, but usually waves are only caused by something vibrating somewhere. Might not be something that you see or are directly um, able to observe, uh, but uh, there is usually some sort of vibration that causes it. All right, and then just for fun, uh, I'll add in a little video about, uh, you know, kind of a crowd wave inside of a classroom. 
right, so hopefully you enjoyed that little video um, from the classroom. Uh, now we're going to move on to the next segment of this lecture, uh, which is parts of a wave. Uh, and the reason why we're going to talk about the different parts is that we can tell if waves are bigger or smaller than each other, um, not just if the uh, disturbances are happening more often or things along those lines. Per usual, you need to uh, make sure you're including some uh, notes uh, and a summary um, of each segment uh, of this series of lectures. All right, so let's talk about wave parts. Um, generally speaking, there are two types of graphs that you'll see for waves. Uh, one is a time graph and the other is a distance graph. Now a time graph just has time on the x-axis, a distance graph just has distance on the x-axis. Um, so in a time graph, we're usually looking at uh, how one particle is moving or uh, vibrating up and down with time. Uh, with a distance graph, we're looking at usually a whole length of particles and seeing um, how each uh, part along the line is vibrating, etc. Or you can think of it uh, as the distance traveled by the disturbance. Now, each graph is important, but um, each graph uh, misses a little bit of information, so we'll talk more about that later. Let's start with the time graph for now. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about on measuring a wave, we've got a nice little sine-like wave here, um, is the top part of a wave uh, we call the crest, and the bottom part of a wave we call the trough. Um, now, these are often useful for just referring to it um, in shorthand. Uh, but you won't see this uh, too much in official uh, descriptions of things. So uh, we often won't reference crests and troughs. We'll talk about uh, the period or the cycle of a wave and more on that in a second. Um, but just in case um, you do need to know, uh, the top of a wave often called a crest, the bottom of a wave called a trough. Um, crest because it just means the top of something like a mountain crest is the top of the mountain. And a trough, if you've never heard of it, is uh, kind of like a little ditch or U-shaped kind of thing. Um, you think of like on a barn, there's like a feed trough where people, or not people, but uh, animals come up and eat out of, um, or a trough on the side of the road for like uh, water to spill into or things like that. So that's kind of why we call it that. Um, now this center line here is called equilibrium. It doesn't actually have to be um, exactly at zero. We could have the entire wave shifted up or something along those lines. Um, but the equilibrium point is basically if we didn't have a disturbance, so if you imagine this as water, um, the water would come back to the equilibrium level after the wave or disturbance passed. Um, so equilibrium is the resting position. And then we need to know that point because we usually use that as a reference to figure out displacement. So displacement is how far from equilibrium um, a, uh, a particle is at any given moment in time. Um, so obviously it's not permanent because usually things are vibrating up and down. So for a while it's up and then it's down and somewhere in between. Um, so displacement is over here on our y-axis. Um, and it just measures at this given moment in time um, how far from equilibrium is the particle um, in its vibration. And it's going to snap back eventually. Now amplitude is the maximum displacement. So we look here at this wave and we can notice that the, uh, the maximum displacement reached um, seems to be about this height here, and it seems to be equal on the bottom as well. Um, we usually reference it as a positive number, but you could technically reference it as a negative number. Um, and amplitude is uh, essentially the distance or the, um, the shift, the displacement uh, from equilibrium position. So notice that it's only kind of half of this height of the wave. Um, as opposed to being from crest to trough. So it's always from equilibrium to crest or equilibrium to trough. Now one wave cycle is one complete up and one complete down if we're talking about something that's kind of sine-like. Um, if it's a different shape, then it's just whenever the pattern repeats. So you might think that after you go um, all the way through one kind of uh, up portion, that it starts to repeat, but notice that this down portion is technically different. It's, it's not the same um, as the up portion. Um, so you can talk about one cycle as either one complete up and one complete down, um, or alternatively, you can just measure it from crest to crest or from trough to trough. That ends up being the same. So in this case, uh, the uh, time for one cycle looks like it's four seconds because that's the time for one complete up to one complete down. From here, we can see that goes from five to nine. So again, that's four seconds, and so it stays consistent. 
Um, so I just mentioned this, but period, uh, the time for one cycle, we can tell it from a time graph. Um, and so that's, that's what that is. Uh, now, frequency doesn't uh, necessarily get listed on the graph, but remember that frequency is just one over the period. Um, so if you can figure out the period from a graph, then you can immediately figure out the frequency from the graph. All right, so time graphs can show period, um, but can't show the length of a wave. So you think about in the physical real world, there's usually like a distance separating one crest to another crest, um, not just time, uh, but a physical length. Um, so that's what we use distance graphs for. Um, but similarly, distance graphs can show us that length between uh, the crests, but it can't show us the time that it took or therefore the frequency or period. So let's talk about distance graphs real fast. Um, they're very similar. The only way you can tell the difference between a distance graph and a time graph for a wave is by looking at the axis or sometimes it's in the title. Remember that the displacement is just how much the weight or the particles are vibrating up and down. It doesn't talk about actual travel or anything along those lines. Um, so in this case, uh, the only new term that we need to really talk about is wavelength. Um, and wavelength is the distance between crests or the distance traveled in one period or one cycle. Um, so if the period was two seconds, how far does this wave travel in one period or one cycle? Now, um, I've just used the same numbers here on the bottom for this example, but it doesn't have to match. So the distance between each of these could be 10 times bigger or 50 times bigger than uh, the time. It all just depends on what type of wave it is, how fast it's moving, and that sort of thing. Um, but here, to measure wavelength, we'll just go the length of one complete up and down, um, or the length between crests, or the length between troughs, and that's how you measure wavelength. Now, wavelength, we use this little upside-down Y-looking thing um, called lambda. Uh, it's a Greek letter. It's the lowercase letter. I think its capital form looks uh, a little bit like a capital L, um, etc. No, actually, I'm wrong on that. I think it's a triangle. Um, so we talked about wavelength a little bit. Um, the last thing we need to talk about is wave speed. Uh, so wave speed, we've talked about how often a wave is occurring. We've talked about the length of a wave. Um, if you combine those two things, you can actually get a little bit about how fast a wave is traveling, literally from point A to point B. Um, and so that is what wave speed is. Now, in a moment, we're going to talk about how to get there from wavelength and frequency. Um, but for now, just think of it as any other speed. So how fast does this crest right here reach this bird sitting on a peg? Um, that is what wave speed is. All right, that's it for this segment. Remember, you should be taking uh, bullet point notes, um, so three or more bullet points, um, and then go and write a one to two sentence summary or so um, and answer any embedded questions from Edpuzzle or whatever other platform we're using. All right, so we're moving on to the next segment of the series of lectures. Um, now we're going to talk about the speed of waves. We already mentioned it briefly in that previous segment, um, but now we're going to talk a little bit more about how to calculate that, and there are actually two different ways, so we'll talk about that. Um, as always, you need to be taking some notes on this, preferably three or more bullet points, and then writing a one to two sentence summary um, just to help you internalize some of the information um, and not let it just like pass right through. Uh, so speed. Uh, the technical definition of speed is the rate of distance per unit time. Uh, now what that means, that sounds very formal, but it actually tells you how to calculate it just in the definition. Um, so literally a rate is any time you have a fraction bar. Um, so a blank per blank. Um, and so what we're going to look at is the rate of distance per means a fraction bar or division symbol, uh, and then time. And that's the definition and therefore the equation of speed. Um, so here our uh, equation that we're looking at is simply just distance divided by time. Uh, the variable that we're going to use for speed is a lowercase v, um, not a capital V. We'll use that for something else. Uh, and it'll actually end up being the same variable we use for velocity as well, um, but more on that later. Uh, also, the units for speed, uh, I know normally we talk about speed in the U.S. as miles per an hour, um, but in science we use the metric system uh, because it's easier for conversions and many other things. Um, it's not quite as random. Um, and then also because the majority of the world uses the metric system, so it just works out better. We have fewer conversion errors and things along those lines. Um, so the units for speed are uh, meters, which is our distance, uh, per, and then seconds. And so this negative one just means per second. Uh, 
Um, you can also write it as m slash s, that works too, um, where that is meters per second. Now, that's all well and good, talking about the distance, literally, like if a wave travels from point A to point B, um, divided by the time. But usually when we see like ocean waves and water waves, it's really hard to measure how far it's going and to time it at the same time. Um, and so we can't always have that information available. So um, we actually can figure out a new way to calculate speed uh, without necessarily being able to see the distance traveled by the wave. Um, and that's what we're gonna look at next. Um, so really it's using uh, this idea of wavelength that we talked about before, uh, as well as the idea of frequency. So if you think about frequency, frequency is the number of waves each second. So if you get five waves each second or 10 waves each second passing through a point. Um, and wavelength tells you how long each of those waves are. So if you combine those two things, what you literally get is a number of like five foot waves or five meter waves passing through each second. Well, that gives you a total distance and the time it takes for it to happen. Um, and so therefore you can actually get speed from that, interestingly enough. So the way we'll do that is uh, we'll have wave speed uh, equals frequency times wavelength. Now our previous way of calculating speed works for anything that's traveling. This really only works for waves and so that's why we do a little italicized V on this most of the time. The units are still meters per second um, and to calculate wave speed from frequency, you literally just need frequency and wavelength and you get wave speed. You're multiplying those two together. Um, now, some interesting notes about patterns for this, because I know we talk about uh, patterns like linear and proportional and inverse. Um, so the relationship between uh, wave speed and frequency is a linear pattern or a proportional pattern. Uh, the uh, relationship between wave speed and wavelength is also a proportional pattern um, or linear pattern. So it follows that kind of y equals mx format. Um, but the relationship between frequency and wavelength actually ends up being inverse. So you think about it for the same wave speed, if one of these increases, the other will decrease. Now that's not usually what happens in the real world, but it's important to know um, in case you are talking about, oh, if you double the frequency, what happens to the length of the waves? Well, in this case, if you double the frequency, it halves the length of, uh, the, length of the wave. Um, so in this case, it would be half as big. All right, so let's recap a little bit real fast. We have two different ways that we're calculating wave speed. Um, one is a general speed calculation, speed equals distance divided by time. Um, and the other is uh, using properties of waves, so frequency and wavelength. Um, so here's some hints on when to use each one. Uh, if you're given a distance traveled and or a time and you're calculating a distance and a time, you probably just wanna use the traditional speed um, equation. Um, but if you're given frequency or wavelength instead, then you probably want to go with the wave speed equation this way. Um, so just pay attention to what the given info is, and that will steer you towards which one to use. That's it for, oh, not quite it for the segment. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that wave speed uh, usually depends on the material a wave is traveling through. Um, so we think about the speed of light. Um, it's a super fast thing. In fact, the fastest thing in the universe, more on that later. Um, but light travels faster through kind of emptiness or space than it does through water. Much like you travel faster through air than you do through water, um, light actually changes its speed based on kind of how hard it is for it to go through a material. So um, light has different speeds through different materials. Um, and each of these is how far light travels in one second, which is pretty fast. So 186,000 miles in one second through kind of empty space. Um, through water only travels 140,000 miles in one second. That's still pretty far. Um, in glass, it travels uh, 124,000 miles in a second. And then a diamond, it actually travels the slowest, um, which is why diamonds have such interesting optical properties. But we'll talk more about that one later. Similarly, uh, sound travels different uh, speeds in different materials. So it's not the frequency that changes how fast it travels. Uh, it's the material it's traveling through, which thankfully that's the case because if it was the frequency, then you would hear like high pitch sounds arrive faster and low pitch sounds and everything would be all discombobbled. Um, but thankfully that's not the case. Um, in this case, uh, the material that sound is traveling through actually affects how fast it travels. 
Interestingly enough, sound actually travels slowest in air compared to some other things. So it travels faster in water, um, in uh, solid things like wood or iron or stone. Um, and that has to do with uh, how sound uh, propagates, so how it uh, travels through those materials uh, versus how light travels through those materials. And we'll talk about that um, a little bit more later. That's it for this one. Please make sure you're taking those notes and doing that summary, uh, and then you can move on to that next segment. All right, and welcome back. Uh, so we're going to move on with this next segment where we're going to talk about transverse versus longitudinal waves, two different categories of waves. Uh, now, as always, you need to be taking some notes uh, through more bullet points and a one to two sentence summary, um, and then complete any questions that are either tagged on to the end of this video or embedded within it from Edpuzzle or something along those lines. All right, so like I mentioned, uh, there are two main categories of waves. These aren't the only two categories of waves. There are others. Uh, but these are the two most uh, common ones that you will see. Uh, the first is a transverse wave, um, and the second is longitudinal. We'll actually talk about them in reverse order of that, so longitudinal, then transverse. Um, now, I could try and explain it, but it really helps if you can see it in motion. Um, these pictures kind of help you with it, but I'm going to embed a video here in a second um, to help go through the difference between those two. In a longitudinal wave, the disturbance that makes up the wave is along the direction in which the wave travels. Longitudinal waves are also referred to as compression waves. In a transverse wave, the disturbance that makes up the wave is perpendicular to the direction in which the wave travels. All right, so hopefully that video helped a little bit. Um, you can find the actual video if you want to watch it again um, at this URL down here. Um, but let's recap real fast. So a longitudinal wave uh, has vibrations that are parallel to the direction of motion. So here, if uh, the wave is traveling to the right, that means things are vibrating right and left, right and left. Um, so we have that the uh, slinkies would be, or slinky coils would be vibrating back and forth, left and right, while the wave or disturbance traveled to the right. So officially, the definition is longitudinal waves are uh, waves with vibrations parallel to the direction of propagation. Remember, that's a fancy word for travel, which brings us, oh, not quite yet. Um, now, there are different parts of it. Uh, so we talk about uh, in a longitudinal wave, we have these compressions where things are closer together and expansions or rarefactions uh, where they're further apart. Um, so please note that sometimes the expansion, or actually more often, the expansion is called a rarefaction. Um, to measure wavelength on a uh, longitudinal wave, we're going to measure from compression to compression or from rarefaction to rarefaction or expansion to expansion. Um, so that's how you would measure it. Um, now, oftentimes these are still graphed in a traditional way that looks like a normal up and down wave. But what you'll notice on the y-axis is that it talks about uh, either pressure or something along those lines, or sometimes it'll be displacement, but it'll say it's left and right displacement um, when the wave is traveling to the right. All right, transverse waves have vibrations that are perpendicular to the direction of travel. So if you imagine a slinky, uh, the wave is traveling here to the right. You can either make one by shaking your hand up and down or into and out of the, the page. So it would be kind of like side to side, um, but not pulsing. Um, so if that makes sense. Um, so transverse waves have vibrations that are perpendicular to the direction of travel or at a right angle to the direction of travel. Um, and we already talked about how to measure their wavelength, which is simply crest to crest or trough to trough. Uh, so some examples of different ones. Um, some examples of uh, transverse waves include uh, secondary seismic waves. There are actually two different types of seismic waves that often occur. Um, so secondary seismic waves, light or electromagnetic waves are also transverse. Um, and then you think about making a wave on a slinky, moving your hand up and down would be a transverse wave. Um, some longitudinal or kind of pulse waves, um, primary seismic waves, these are kind of the first ones to arrive. Uh, sound waves are also longitudinal waves, um, and back and forth or kind of pulsing slinky waves would be another one. Um, now I've put here uh, that uh, ocean waves or water waves um, are neither transverse nor longitudinal. They kind of look like they're transverse, but it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. Um, for an explanation, you can go to this link down here, um, but I'll actually kind of show you in a second what that looks like as well. 
Okay, so here's an example of a longitudinal wave. So we can see that these pulses here travel um, along the length of this tube. Um, but what's actually happening to the particles, um, they've handily kind of uh, highlighted uh, a red one here. We can see that the particle actually just vibrates back and forth. And the reason why we see a pulse kind of go down is because that particle hits other ones and kind of transfers its energy to it. Um, so in a longitudinal wave, we'll see particles that kind of vibrate back and forth, uh, but the pulse still goes along um, the tube or along whatever it's traveling. Um, now here, uh, this is an example of how sound works. So like a speaker kind of vibrates back and forth like this, um, and then it just vibrates the air, which in turn sends pulses through the rest of the air. A transverse wave is uh, something that's a little bit more common and easily seen, where we again see the particles just kind of going up and down uh, rather than moving um, back and forth. Um, and then the disturbance or the wave travels uh, down the thing. Um, so here they're vibrating at right angles. Now we talked earlier and mentioned earlier that uh, water waves are a little bit different. Um, that's because they're actually kind of a combo of the two. Um, it's technically called a Raleigh wave, I believe, or Raleigh wave. Um, so what we're seeing, um, not when the wave is crashing, but just when waves are like kind of traveling through the ocean, etc., is the water particle actually uh, kind of rotates in a circle. So it's kind of like a combo of both the longitudinal and the transverse wave here. Um, and at the surface, it does so more movement, and then down below, it's a little bit less movement, etc. Um, so here again, you can see that this kind of moves in a circle and then collides with the other water and then kind of sends the wave down there. Um, so just a little interesting side note about that. You don't need to know about these um, combo waves like this. Um, you just need to know about uh, transverse and longitudinal. Now per usual, go ahead and make sure you take care of your bullet points of notes uh, as well as your one to two sentence summary. All right, hello again and welcome back. Uh, this next segment is going to be on wave phenomena. Now the word phenomena just means like uh, something interesting or occurrence, kind of an event of sorts. Um, and so we're going to talk about three different phenomena um, in this part, but there's another segment a little bit later that talks about a couple more. Um, we won't hit all of them uh, that exist in the world, but we will hit the major ones. Um, so this one we're going to talk about reflection, refraction, and diffraction. Um, three different phenomena, even though they kind of sound the same when we talk about them. And we've got three examples, one of each over here. Uh, per usual, you need to take some notes uh, and do a one to two sentence summary. All right, so uh, reflection. Sometimes waves, you think about sound, um, sometimes they bounce off of things instead of being absorbed. So you think about like if you stand a little ways away from a wall and then you clap your hands, you can hear the echo of the clap. Well, that echo is actually a reflection of the sound, where the sound literally travels to the wall, bounces off the wall, and then comes back, not unlike throwing a ball at the wall. So this is called a reflection, when waves are bounced back in some way, shape, or form. Uh, now, all types of waves can reflect um, sound, light, ocean water, seismic, etc. Um, so you think about like if there was an earthquake uh, here at the surface, you might see seismic waves travel down and bounce off of some new type of soil down there. So there are different like layers of soil. So it might bounce off of the bedrock and then kind of bounce back. Um, that would be a reflection. Um, however, one thing to note is that reflections always occur at boundaries or sudden changes in a material. Um, so here it's going from soil to like bedrock. Um, it doesn't always have to be um, a necessarily uh, a new material it might just be a change in the density of the material so going from like super uh, loose and light soil to really hard packed soil even if it's the same type um, so any significant change can cause a uh, reflection of sorts um, but there are other properties that can cause it too sometimes uh, kind of counterintuitively even um, now sometimes most of the, the wave or energy is reflected. So looking at this like giraffe in the mirror, we can see the giraffe here and most of the light is bouncing off of the mirror and coming to the camera. Um, but sometimes it's only partial. So you think about like windows where you kind of see a ghost like reflection happening. Um, so that means some of the light is actually going through the window and some of it is reflecting. Um, so that's always true. It doesn't have to be a perfect, like all of the energy reflects. Sometimes it can just be a portion of the uh, energy being reflected. 
Um, now, when things are reflecting, they always bounce off at the same angle they came in at. Um, so if this is a mirror right here, we think about a laser shining down, it's going to bounce back at the same angle it came in at, um, but obviously can continue back or going in that way, shape or form. Um, now that angle, instead of measuring it from the surface, we actually measure it from what's called the normal line to the surface. So the normal line is just a perpendicular line to the surface. So you think about at a right angle and we measure the angle from there. Um, the reason why is because it helps us with a calculation later on when we talk about refraction, um, that it's that angle and not this angle right here. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, when a wave reflects, it bounces back at the same angle. Um, so here we can say theta one is equal to theta two. Pretty simple, there's no real equation for that. Um, one thing to note is that we call the angle coming in the angle of incidence. So you think about an incident, it's something that happened. Um, so this is the angle of like things happening. And then the angle of reflection is the angle um, after it comes out. Uh, so this would be the outgoing angle as opposed to the incoming angle. Um, now, the way, and this is a little bit of an aside, but the way we actually see things in the world um, is because they reflect light. So it's not always apparent that light is being reflected, um, but you think about it, the major source of light in our entire planet uh, is the sun. Um, so unless you're using a light bulb, like the sun is what's providing you the light to see something. Um, now we see something because literally the sun shines all sorts of different colors of light down. It bounces off of the grass or whatever you're looking at, and the grass might absorb the red and the blue light, um, but then reflect the green light. And so that's what we're, or why we're able to see the grass and why it actually looks green to us because that's the only color light that it reflects. <coughs> Excuse me. If you wanna kind of test this out yourself, you can actually hold up like a colored piece of paper, um, pick something bright, like a nice neon color, hold it up to a, a white wall or um, a, a white piece of computer paper, and you can literally see that white piece of computer paper start to glow that same color as the paper a little bit. I and mean, that's because the paper is reflecting that pink light or green light or yellow light um, onto the wall, and then the wall is then reflecting it back to your eye. So. Um, that's how we see things is by reflection um, and the color that's reflected is the color something looks. Um, so when we, if there is no light source, then we don't see anything. So here would be an example if we took the sun away and there was no light source, we wouldn't be able to see anything. So it's not that our eye shoots anything out to see stuff, it's that actually some light source reflects light off of the surface and that's how we see. Now. You might be like, but Mr. Canning, why is it that when I'm looking at the grass, I can't like, you know, check my hair or anything like that in the reflection of the grass? Well, it's because there are two different types of reflection. Um, there's reflection where it kind of keeps everything together in terms of the image. And then there's diffuse reflection where it kind of just blurs out and goes in all different directions. Um, so specular or kind of optical reflection happens on a very smooth surface with very few irregularities. And so what we get is that if there's like an order to how things are shining in, then that order is kind of kept, it's reversed, but it's at least kept as it shines out. Versus diffuse reflection is how we actually see objects most of the time. Um, and so that usually is because the surface is a little bit bumpy um, and is not reflecting things quite as uniformly or as cleanly um, as um, something like a mirror or a very still pond or things like that. So we can actually use a pond as an example. Um, so here we see a mountain up here um, and we've got a little lake or pond down here and we can see the reflection of that mountain um, or of that hillside in the pond. Um, so the light from the mountain is, uh, from the sun is bouncing off the mountain, coming down, bouncing off the pond and then going into this person's camera. So that is specular reflection or optical reflection. And if we came and threw a stone into that river or that pond, we would see the ripples would uh, disturb that reflection and it wouldn't be as clean or as easy. Um, so that would be a little bit more closer to diffuse. Uh, but we can also see diffuse reflection where sunlight is coming in, bouncing off a tree and then coming to the camera. And that is diffuse reflection um, in this case. So we use diffuse reflection to actually see an object 
we use specular reflection to act more like a mirror where we're kind of able to see uh, objects uh, that aren't in our line of sight, so bouncing images of sorts. Um, so reflection, we just talked about it, is bouncing of uh, lights or sound or whatever type of wave it is. So here we've got a reflection in the mirror for this baby. Refraction is the bending of light. Um, so here we see a laser and it goes through this uh, plastic or glass right here and literally bends and then bends back when it leaves. So that's what refraction is, is it's the bending of light and we'll talk more or any other wave. Um, so normally you think about waves and they travel in a straight line whether it's light or sound or whatever. Um, however, its path can bend if it enters a new material where the wave travels faster or slower. So as this light transitions to this material where it travels a little bit slower, it bends. But then when it transitions back to the air, it bends back. So anytime you have a change in speed of the wave, so the actual wave speed, um, we'll notice that its path or the direction it travels bends a little bit, and this is called refraction. Now this happens, um, uh, or sorry, before I get to that, um, more simply put, refraction is the bending of wave path due to a change in speed. Um, and usually that change in speed is caused by a change in the material itself. Either it gets more dense or less dense, or maybe it's a whole new material what, um, completely. Um, now we talked earlier about how different types of waves travel at different speeds and different materials, and that's what is causing this. Um, so we might see some refraction happen as light goes into water or out of water or into glass or a diamond. Um, similarly, you would see refraction of sound as it goes from air to water and back, etc. Um, so remember that the speed of a wave is determined by the material it's traveling through. So usually if we see a refraction, we've seen um, some sort of change in that material. Um, you can also change it uh, just by changing the properties. So again, like if we had air that was less dense versus more dense, we might see a slight refraction there. Um, this also happens on the coast, which is what I was uh, jumping ahead to, but I realized I wasn't there yet. Um, so here we have ocean waves coming in, um, but we can see them start to bend towards the uh, coastline or the beach here as they get closer and the water is shallower. Um, and that's because the properties um, of wave travel uh, are different for deep water versus shallow water. Um, and in fact, the waves travel slower in shallow water. Um, and so as a result, uh, it's going to bend towards uh, the coastline um, there. So here we have the, to break it down, we have the original direction of the wave. Um, and then we have the new direction of the waves because we're looking at all the crests. Um, and so we can see that its path bent. Um, because it moves uh, slower um, in shallower water. Uh, another example of refraction, although we can't see the change in speed, uh, we can't see its effect. If you've ever seen like a straw going into water and it looks like it's kind of broken here um, or bent in a way, um, that's because the light is just getting distorted. Um, so you think about refraction, if you wear glasses or contact lenses, um, we use refraction to kind of refocus light sometimes or to get it out of focus, but by bending it in different ways and directions. Um, and so that is one benefit to refraction or one use of refraction. Um, so at this point, my bear, right, cool. Uh, we've got waves, they bend as they go into uh, new materials. How do you tell which way those waves bend? Well, I'm going to give you an analogy here, um, and it's uh, with wagon wheels, or you can imagine two little Lego wheels. So if you imagine this as like a little Lego wheel that you just pulled off a car, and you're rolling it on cement versus on grass, um, you can actually predict what way it will go. Um, and the way it goes is the same way light or sound or something else would go. So think about it for a second, maybe pause. Which direction do you think the wagon wheels will go? Right. The answer is, in fact, C, um, and here's why. So we think about cement. Uh, the wheels can move a lot faster on cement, and on grass, the wheels move a little bit slower because it's harder for them to roll. So cement is our fast material. Grass is our slow material. Well, as the wheels reach the boundary, this wheel here on our left-hand side is going to start to move slower. So in the next second, it's only going to go like, you know, an inch. But the wheel that's still on cement is going to keep moving fast. So in the next second, it'll move like five inches. 
Well, if one side is only moving a little bit and the other side's moving a lot, that causes it to rotate. You can try this at home by like taking one small step with your left leg and one big step with your right leg, and then just keep doing that small step left leg, big step right leg, and see what happens to you. Um, but ultimately what happens is it begins to pivot or turn around the slow side. Another way to think about it is this wheel gets anchored a little bit, and so it bends towards that anchor of sorts. So you might be like, Mr. Canning, why are we talking about wheels and cement and wagon wheels or Lego wheels? Well, the reason why is because light does the same thing. Um, so in this case, if we look at laser light going from air to water, or it could even be sound, um, but basically we can use that wagon wheel principle to figure out what direction uh, waves are going to bend. So here air is the faster material and water is the slower material. So if we imagine um, that would mean that our uh, this left hand side right here uh, would get anchored first and so it would bend towards the normal line from where it originally was shining. And this is why things look a little weird underwater or why they look a little bit different. Um, now one thing to notice here is we have this thing called the index of refraction up here, um, the n number. This actually tells you how fast or slow light moves in a material. Um, the index of refraction, the lower it is, the faster the material is, um, and the slower or bigger the number, the uh, slower it is. All right, so the other way you can think about this uh, is sometimes people just like to remember um, rather than using wagon wheels. Um, you can just remember that anytime something or wave enters a slower material, it will bend towards the normal line. Remember that the normal line is the uh, line that is perpendicular to the surface that it's encountering. Um, and then when entering a faster uh, material, it's going to bend uh, away from the normal line. So you think about a laser that went from underwater to above, it would actually bend the opposite direction. Now, I mentioned before, we have this index of refraction here. We'll talk a little bit more about that now. Um, so with light, the N number or the index of refraction uh, tells you how fast or slow uh, 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 light is moving in that. It's something that we use specifically for light because uh, we often do optical properties, uh, bending and refracting, et cetera, for lenses and that sort of stuff. Um, and so this index of refraction, the bigger it is, the slower light is moving in that material. Um, and we use this index of refraction in an equation called Snell's law, where the index of refraction times the uh, sine of the angle of incidence is equal to the index of refraction of the next material times the sine of the angle of it, uh, refraction. And so we can actually use this equation to uh, predict uh, or make calculations around refraction, either what type of material we need or how much it's going to bend. All right, so we talked about reflection as bouncing. We talked about refraction as bending. Um, now let's talk about diffraction, which is when waves spread out after going through like a barrier or boundary. So you think about waves, if they encountered a barrier, they don't actually do this. They don't just get chopped off or blocked completely by that barrier. Um, but if this was, I don't know, water being sprayed, um, we would see that, yeah, it, the barrier would basically create a nice little protected area back here. Um, but with waves, they do something different, not all the time, but many of the times. So that's not what happens. What happens is they begin to spread out again behind the barrier. Um, so there isn't quite that same protected area. Um, maybe a little bit, maybe it's not quite as like big a waves right here, etc. Um, but the waves will begin to spread out after passing a barrier. Um, but this also happens after passing openings. So here we've got different waves going through different types of openings and we can see how they would spread out. Um, so if they go through a wide opening and it's a small wavelength, we see them spread out a little bit. But if it's a narrow opening with a small wavelength, they'll spread out more. So kind of the narrower the opening, the more it begins to kind of spread out again compared to the wavelength itself. Um, or if we had a, uh, sorry, a wide opening uh, with a large wavelength, uh, we would again see it spread out. Um, here we can see it going around a barrier where kind of the wavelength itself, we see the effect more with larger wavelengths than we do with smaller wavelengths. So this is again called diffraction.
Now, this idea helps explain uh, a couple things in everyday life. One, um, like why we can still get radio reception in hilly areas. And I'm not saying it's perfect, but you don't actually have to have a radio tower have a direct pathway to you um, or wherever your car or house is. Um, it can kind of bend around hills and other things. Um, and the other way is because it also enables us to uh, hear around corners. So you think about uh, even if you're standing like, you know, right here um, behind a, a wall or something like that and somebody's talking over on this side, the sound bends around that wall and you can actually still hear them um, pretty clearly. Not perfectly, but pretty clearly. Um, and that idea is called diffraction. So it's any time waves spread out after uh, going past a barrier or a um, narrow opening. Um, so to recap real fast, reflection is the bouncing of a wave. Um, it's usually caused by uh, a wave reaching a boundary or edge of a material. Um, refraction is the bending of a wave, specifically caused by uh, a wave having a change in speed when entering a new material or a material with like a slightly different property. Um, and then last but not least, uh, diffraction is the spreading out of a wave after going around a barrier or through a narrow opening. That's it. Please make sure that you uh, take your notes uh, and do a one to two sentence summary. All right. Hello again. And we're going to continue on with wave phenomena. This is part two. We're looking at interference and resonance this time. Per usual, you'll need three or more bullet points worth notes for this uh, lecture segment and a one to two sentence summary at the end of it. So we're going to be looking at what happens when these waves hit and then also using some swings to talk about resonance. So let's start off with that first one. What happens when two waves uh, hit or are in the same place at the same time or however you want to think about it? So we've got wave A and wave B. Um, they're both the same height to start off with and they're heading towards each other. When they meet in the middle, what does that look like? Take a second, think about it, maybe draw it on a piece of paper. All right, so while they're overlapping or in the same place at the same time, their displacements add together. So literally, if these two are the same heights, the kind of combined wave is now going to be twice as big. Um, if there are different heights, we would just add those heights uh, together. So if it was a two and a one, we would just add two plus one um, to figure it out. So that's what's going on here, um, where their displacements add together. And this is called uh, the principle of superposition. Um, super meaning on top of and position. So literally one is positioned on top of another. Um, so this idea describes that the displacements of two or more overlapping waves uh, just add together. So if you had three waves, all of their displacements would just add together. So next question. In general, superposition means that uh, the waves stack on top of each other, but what happens after they overlap? So after this moment in time, uh, do they bounce off of each other? Do they just like disappear? Do they blow up? Like, what do they do? So take a moment, think about it. All right, so it actually happens to be that the waves go on their merry way. Now remember, a wave is just a disturbance. It's not an actual thing per se. Um, so what that means is, is that each of these disturbances just kind of pass right through each other, kind of like a, a ghost passing through each other or something along those lines. Um, so if uh, this is still wave B kind of heading the same direction and this is still wave A heading the same direction. So sometimes it'll look like they bounce off of each other when they're the same size wave, but in reality they're actually just passing right through each other. Um, and it's only in that moment that they overlap where we actually see the bigger wave happen. So here's a series of examples. We can see again like the short wave on the uh, low amplitude wave on the right hand side and the bigger amplitude wave on the left hand side um, to help show that they've actually passed through each other. So here we have them heading towards each other. They begin to overlap. We can see it starts to kind of add together a little bit there. And here they're fully overlapped and we can see literally one stacks on top of each other to make this new height. And then finally they just keep going. So that small one just keeps going through, um, etc. So they don't actually interact with each other um, permanently um, in any meaningful way. Uh, it's just while they are, are overlapping that they are kind of combining. So then take a moment and think about what happens if opposite waves collide. So we have here a kind of a positive amplitude and here a negative amplitude. What do you think that looks like when they're overlapping? All right, hopefully you took a moment to think about it. So if you have, let's say, a positive one overlapping with a negative one, if you just add those together, that comes out to zero. 
So in this case, based on superposition, their displacements actually cancel out. But again, it's only going to be temporary. So they'll go on their merry way afterwards as if nothing had ever happened. Um, so here again, we get a temporary overlap um, where the amplitudes or sorry, displacements add together. If it's positive and negative, that ends up actually canceling out a little bit. Um, but if it's positive and positive or negative and negative, it'll make it bigger in that direction, whether it's the positive direction or the negative direction. Um, so here's uh, that kind of summarized in a nice image here for us. And we actually call this uh, when the two waves are adding together to make a bigger wave, we call it constructive interference. It's still called superposition as an idea, um, but to specify what type of superposition, kind of um, building or kind of canceling, uh, we just call it constructive interference. And in general, we can call superposition interference. Now, when we uh, have two waves that overlap and one's positive and one's negative and they partially cancel out for a little bit of time or cancel out for a little bit of time, we call that uh, destructive interference. Um, and so this is when they cancel out. Now, it doesn't have to be a full um, interference, uh, so it doesn't have to be fully uh, canceling out in this way. Sometimes it'll be, just be partial. Now, we can actually use this principle in um, some really cool real-world scenarios. Um, so many of you have started to see or maybe have borrowed somebody's headphones that are noise canceling. Some cars even have this to minimize engine noise now. Um, but what they do is they put a little microphone on the outside of the headphone and that microphone picks up any sound coming in. Uh, and then using that sound, they basically just flip that sound wave upside down and then mix it in with your music or whatever it is you're actually trying to listen to. So what that means is, is that you have the actual sounds kind of being the positive um, and then the new flipped sound adding together, which is negative, and so they'll cancel out. Now you can imagine the time in which they have to hear it, flip it, and then mix it in, going from the microphone one inch in towards the speaker, um, isn't very long. So this isn't a perfect thing. It doesn't work with very complex sounds like voices and things like that, but it works pretty well for low rumbling sounds uh, like engine noises, especially on airplanes and stuff like that. Um, and so that's what active noise canceling is. If you ever hear about passive noise canceling, that's literally just like holding pillows up to your ear. It's just using something soft to cancel or block noise. It's not actively canceling it out. Um, so that's a little bit about how we use that technology in the real world. Now, another way in which we see this in the real world um, is uh, at a beach near where I grew up. So I grew up in Long Beach and there's a beach down there uh, at Newport Beach called The Wedge. Uh, it's a little surf spot. Um, and what happens is uh, waves come in and they bounce off this jetty. Um, and then as they bounce off, they overlap with other waves coming back in. So we get two waves, sometimes five foot waves on their own, overlapping at the same spot to create a huge wave for just one single spot. Um, so you can imagine if you're in that right spot, that's either really great or really bad, depending on whether you want to be there or not. Um, but you can see kind of the how that would affect it. Um, so we've talked a little bit about waves overlapping. Now let's uh, kind of switch gears a little bit and we're going to talk more about kind of overlapping pushes and waves, but in a slightly different scenario. So imagine you are pushing a friend on a swing um, and if you time it right, your friend gets to go higher and higher and higher. But what if you timed it wrong? Like what if you pushed them while they were still kind of coming back to you? you'd think how those two would overlap um, in destructive interference and your friend wouldn't really get to swing back and forth too much. They'd kind of just shake back and forth and it wouldn't really be very fun. Um, well, this idea of having to time your push or time how you are um, pushing the person deals with resonance. Um, and so resonance is this idea where you can overlap um, uh, previous pushes or waves or oscillations and if you time it right, it actually just keeps building on it. So it's constructive interference building on more and more and more. So each tiny push results in a much, much bigger end result. Um, and this is because, again, they're kind of adding on to previous motion. Um, so this is the idea of resonance, the idea that if you vibrate something, so you have to actually do some work and vibrate it or whatever, um, but if you vibrate something at the natural frequency it wants to swing or vibrate or um, move, um, then you can actually create a situation where waves just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, you can actually try this on your own if you have a cup of water. 
Um, you can try walking. There's a certain speed with which if you walk and take your steps, you'll get the water sloshing back and forth more and more and more and more until it starts to go everywhere. Um, but if you walk just a little bit faster, or a little bit slower, then you can avoid that. So um, we already talked about this a little bit, but you can imagine how if you pushed somebody at the wrong time, your push would kind of cancel out their motion. So what we're trying to do with resonance is time the pushes so that it's constructively interfering with the kind of the natural rhythm of something's vibration or swing. Um, so we mentioned this, but uh, your frequency matches the swings. We say this is an example of resonance. Um, and so that is kind of what resonance is. Um, the result of having two things uh, resonating can be really fun. Um, so that is one example we've talked about with swings kind of and pushing, um, but it can also be really destructive if you don't want it. An example of that would be a wine glass. And if you cause it to resonate by singing at the right frequency or playing the right frequency for a uh, note, um, you can actually cause that wine glass to vibrate. Now, if you think about it, glass doesn't really like to vibrate and shift and move. So that can be very destructive. Uh, if you give me a moment, I'll insert that video here. Cool. So hopefully you got to see that video. Um, we've got this idea that uh, resonance occurs when you drive or vibrate something at its natural frequency because you're literally adding more waves onto each other and overlapping them using some small waves to kind of overlap and create a bigger effect. Um, and it can have some pretty powerful results. Um, now, I mentioned this before, but if we try and vibrate a frequency or vibrate something at a frequency different than its natural frequency, that'd be like you pushing somebody at the wrong moments on a swing, um, then what happens is really nothing. It's kind of boring. So you imagine most of the time if you have like a glass on the table and you're talking near it or playing music near it, it might vibrate a little bit, but it really isn't going to move very much. Um, so that's the normal. You really have to kind of find that one magic note for different things to cause them to vibrate um, in uh, kind of bigger ways. Um, so we talked about it being destructive here with the wine glass in cars and planes. That is also a place where it's destructive. You can imagine if parts are jiggling and vibrating too much, um, that would be very bad. And there are actually some like uh, very classic examples. Uh, I think the Tacoma Narrows Bridge um, is a good example of where that can end spectacularly bad. All right, so to recap, uh, we talked about interference, the idea when waves combine either constructively to form a bigger wave or destructively to form a smaller wave. And then we talked about resonance, um, which builds off that idea of kind of constructive interference in a cyclical way so that you get a bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger vibration. Um, so really you're taking small vibrations and using them to amplify or make something bigger. It'd be like if uh, five people were all singing the same note versus one person, it starts to build and add up. Um, and that's it for this segment. Uh, hopefully you wrote three or more bullet points worth of notes in your one to two sentence summary.